So um, I just wanted to share uh, before we jump into today's um, on-demand position on this Waves of Wakefulness, I wanted to kind of share the model again. So this is the Waves of Wakefulness model. Um, way of mapping the process of waking up. And, um, you know, I wanted to kind of mention or just kind of talk a little bit about how this model really, in a way, it's, it's something that typically unfolds over a particular time scale or time span. Um, in my experience, and I don't want to get too specific about this because it, you know, it, 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 there's a large variation or variance in how people experience these things. But in general terms, um, this is something that usually unfolds over the course of more than a decade um, for people, typically. Um, now, some people can go very quickly from the initial glimpse to the top of the wave. Uh, I've noticed that. I've seen that happen, actually. Uh, someone who's quite close to me. Um, uh, they were in the dark night phase before having an initial glimpse and they went into a two month retreat and they came out at the top of the wave. Um, so it's six weeks. Uh, they went through this entire process, which for most people takes years and maybe decades. Uh, now their process, their process of integration, cause I know this person again, fairly closely was, um, really rough. Uh, really challenging. So it's not like I would recommend that, uh, actually, but it's possible. Sometimes people have just like a natural ability or inclination toward awakening. Um, but then the integration part seems much harder. And I don't, I've never seen anyone uh, integrate awakening uh, smoothly. <laughs> um, maybe maybe there's been some people that have done it, but uh, I suspect they already were very mature to begin with. Um, so just, just kind of wanted to mention uh, that time scale, and then I wanted to kind of uh, also zoom out a little bit for a moment and kind of mention uh, this bigger time scale that actually uh, that, that this is happening within, um, right? Uh, and here it is, um, the bigger time scale. This is the bigger wave in which all these, <laughs> these, this wave is arising. Uh, it's the it's the wave of our life, birth and death, and and we could zoom out even further. To me, awakening really is um, a fractal, or or one way of talking about it that's as helpful is as a fractal. Um, you know, in, insofar as um, with awakening, we could zoom all the way in to even a full breath. You know, the cycle of one breath. It's the same basic wave. And there is the possibility of waking up and down uh, in breathing in each breath. You know, that, actually, that's the only place we ever do wake up and wake down is in this sensory experience in this moment-to-moment -moment way. Uh, and then you could zoom all the way back out, you know, to the to the biggest time scales we know of, which are the birth and death of the universe itself. You know, going back all the way to the Big Bang. Um, there's this famous koan in Zen, show, show me your original face um, before your parents were born. And, and now we can kind of update that, right? You know, to show me your original face um, before the Big Bang. Because we know uh, a little bit more now about the material universe and about its, what it's made of and how it was born. We've seen the cosmic back, background radiation from the Big Bang. We've actually peered back through space and time to see the birth uh, of our own universe. And so we know actually that everything is born and dies, including our universe, uh, or at least that's our th current best working theory. Um, and so to me, awakening is about this. It's about birth and death uh, at the most fundamental level. It's about the arising and passing away, um, the spreading and collapsing of uh, reality. And, and, and the particular way that we experience that as a human being. Um, so anyway, just a, just a bit of a big picture, zooming out uh, you know, to see where this map and model is situated. And then today, I wanted to speak specifically about the second position of on-demand. But to get there, uh, you know, we have to at least mention the initial glimpse. Um, and, and the way that I wanted to do this is just by by mentioning a very simple model 
um, that I picked up from a, a Christian contemplative nun named Bernadette Roberts. And Bernadette Roberts wrote in a book called The Experience of No Self. And that's the reason I read it, because I was like, who is this Christian nun <laughs> talking about no self? Uh, and it turns out, and I, as I learned more about the Christian contemplative tradition, she, she really was a, an apophatic practitioner. And in, in the Christian contemplative tradition, they sometimes will distinguish between what's called cataphatic prayer and apophatic prayer. And this, in some ways, it kind of mirrors the distinction in Buddhism of, of uh, fullness and emptiness. You know, cataphatic has like vision, a visionary quality and love and feeling and, you know, form. And then the apophatic prayer uh, mode is more formless, uh, empty, uh, devoid of content. And so she was describing her experience of, as, as a kind of an apophatic Christian path. And so then the no self experience is really a characteristic of that path. Um, and so uh, the way she described this in a very simple model, which I, which I really like, uh, is she talked about the self in terms of being like a, like a circle. So here we have uh, you know, a little circle. And then the initial glimpse, the initial experience of no self, that is like there being a dot uh, punctured in the hole of self. It's like we see through the self in a way that punctures uh, our experience of it. And that begins this process of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of awakening uh, on this scale, on this level. And one way of talking about what happens as one moves from the initial glimpse to on demand is that this circle, this experience of no self at the center uh, begins to kind of grow and expand to take up more of the space of the circle. That is our experience of emptiness or uh, of the suchness of experience begins to expand to include more and more of our experience. Um, typically moving from the most gross and obvious aspects of experience, like the body feelings to the more subtle dimensions of experience like subtle thought forms or even the process the mental processes of attention and intention of knowing uh, and doing and um, one of the things one of the ways i think we could describe this flip um, this switch to the on de to the on demand position is that yeah, we are getting about 50 percent of the way up uh, up the up the mountain or you could say using this model right using the the kind of circle model this dot in the center of the circle takes up 50 percent of the self or more and there's some important flip when our perception of emptiness uh, of the empty nature of experience is um, more than half of of what we experience or, or we tend to go there more most of the time then there's like an identity shift that takes place where we start to identify with emptiness with this experience of suchness um, and it becomes extremely accessible to us in perception in experience in a way that wasn't previous um, now, one of my early teachers, Daniel Ingram, uh, and the, the, he, he had a map that he presents and uses to describe this waking up process. Uh, and it comes from the early Buddhist tradition. It's called the uh, four path model. It describes four stages uh, toward, toward awake, toward full enlightenment. Um, and this was the map that I was using to help guide my practice um, for the first like decade or so that I was, I was practicing, uh, maybe a little less than a decade. And um, in that map, uh, in Daniel's revised four path model, because he made some changes from the traditional one that I think were necessary and helpful, uh, you know, not talking about enlightenment as being like, you get rid of all, uh, all possible feelings of desire or, or aversion or, or that you no longer can, you know, hurt someone physically because you're awake. Uh, or if you're, you know, there's one thing in the, in the old Pali canon which says if, if you become a fully enlightened and you don't become a monk after that, you'll die. <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah. So he took all of those, those kind of um, ways of talking about enlightenment, which he, which he described as limited emotional range and limited action models. 
models of enlightenment that say when you get enlightened, there's a, that you actually become limited in terms of the range of possible experiences you can have or limited in terms of the possible actions you can take. And he said, no, 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 no. Enlightenment doesn't change the range uh, of what you can experience or how you can act. If anything, it might ex extend that range, um, but it doesn't limit you. So we have to talk about enlightenment differently. And so he talks about it in a much more uh, phenomenological way in terms of how it changes perception. And here's how he describes what he calls the third path, which I call this on-demand position. To me, they're the same. Third path individuals, writes Daniel, begin to see that they can perceive the emptiness, selflessness, impermanence, luminosity, etc., of many sensations in daily life. Perception tends to get broader, more spacious, more expansive, more through and through, with awakening being now more of a waking, walking around experience. So to me, this is a great description of what it's like to, uh, to shift into this place in practice where it's like a real-time perception on demand. Whenever we go to look for it, it <laughs> it's there. Uh, now, we don't exactly know what it is. <laughs> uh, that's the weird thing. It's like we're having this paradoxical experience of knowing what some things are, thinking we do, and then not knowing a lot of what's going on. And, and that being actually uh, a refuge or a place that we can abide or rest uh, and, and access when we, when we turn attention and intention toward that. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the challenges that come up with this position, because as we continue to move up the wave, in a way, um, again, we're continuing to expand the circle from 51% to eventually 100%. Um, to the, the experience of, of no self, of, of, of total emptiness, is the always already position in this map. Um, and so there's a process of continuing to refine uh, and deepen and broaden one's experience of emptiness or suchness. Here, Daniel Ingram again describes what it's like in this process of deepening. He says, by the mature stage of the third path, which for most can take months or years to show up, the practitioner is more and more able to see the selfless, centerlessness, luminosity, etc., of phenomena in real time. So much so that it can be very difficult to notice what artificial perceptual dualities remain. And, and here again, I kind of think of this in terms of that, um, uh, the wave of wakefulness model. Like if you look at what it's like as you go up the wave and you get right toward the top of the third position, but you're not quite there yet. In the same way that it's like driving up a hill, you're getting to the crest or the top of the hill. It's like suddenly the view opens up. Everything becomes much more expansive. It's, it's, like, it's almost like you're there at the top. It, it, it feels that way and looks that way and seems that way, but there's still some forward movement, some leaning toward or trying to kind of subtly strive toward uh, this awakening experience. And that is ultimately what has to be relinquished or seen through. Uh, when we don't do that, we fall prey to what my teacher Kenneth Folk calls virtual enlightenment. Uh, and this is the main challenge to me of this of this uh, of this position in, uh, on the on the on the journey. Uh, Kenneth describes virtual enlightenment this way. He says, "Virtual enlightenment is what happens when someone forms a concept of enlightenment and mistakes it for insight." And to me, this becomes such a such an issue at this point because our experience because we're in a real-time connection with this sort of impossible to describe-ness of experience, that it's so easy to begin to think that we know what it is, to begin to identify the state, quote unquote, and to um, subtly confuse our new 
profound perceptual abilities with these new subtle ideas about what enlightenment is. Oh, enlightenment must be this deep stillness and spaciousness and formless experience. Well, no, actually that's a state, uh, but it feels very free and very open and very peaceful. So we think, oh, that must be enlightenment, peace, openness, freedom. Ah, yeah, no, actually, <laughs> uh, that is a that is a new subtle idea, and it and it becomes uh, it becomes an obstacle on the path. It becomes part of what we have to learn uh, to let go of. I wanted to share um, this quote from Chekim Trungpa, where he kind of talks about this, um, and here he talks about it in terms of form and emptiness. He says, "Form is in itself empty." Of preconception so when we're experiencing something there isn't in the direct experience preconceptions about it right even in thinking you know sometimes there's a thought arises and we're not necessarily they're not pre, there's not a preconception in the thought I mean it's just a thought it's a concept that's arising um, so it's it's part of form form is is in itself empty of preconception but emptiness is form. This means that at this level of understanding, we place too much value on seeing form naked of preconceptions. We would like to experience this kind of insight as though seeing form as empty were a state we could force our minds to achieve. We search for emptiness so that it too becomes a thing, a form instead of true emptiness. It is a problem of too much ambition, he concludes. <laughs> so for me, that's what this on-demand position is really, it's about, it's about a subtle refinement of our understanding of emptiness and a seeing through in the subtle ambition that we have to, to arrive at some kind of position or state that's other than the one that's occurring. Um, and when we do finally let go of that tendency and habit, which is a gradual process um, that also uh, is complete in moments, um, then we are always already awake. And we no longer have to try to get access to awakening. Um, there's no longer someone who is meditating. Um, it's just what it is. <laughs>